You're listening to a CNA podcast. Seta Tawisin is set to be Thailand's next prime minister after securing enough votes in parliament. Three months after Thais went to the polls, the country finally has a new leader. Though it isn't the person many had hoped for. It was a dizzying journey to choose Thailand's 30th prime minister. So how did we get here? Here's what happened in 30 seconds. Move Forward Party swept to a surprise victory in the May 14th general election in a clear public rejection of years of military-backed rule. Move Forward formed a coalition with seven other parties. But lawmakers in parliament twice scuttled leader Pita Limjarenrat's bid for the top job. Move Forward was kicked out of the coalition, runner-up Puatai took over, and their nominee for prime minister, Mr. Seta, was voted in. Oh, and former Premier Thaksin Shinawat arrived home after 15 years in self-imposed exile the same day as the lawmakers vote. But more on that later. Okay, it's enough to make your head spin. Definitely a challenging assignment for CNAs Saksit Saisambut and Mei Wong, our correspondents on the ground in Thailand, and they join me now. Hi, guys. Hey, Teresa. Hi. Saksit and Mei, our viewers, they've been watching your marathon coverage, but what they don't see, Saksit, is when we set up for your live crosses, I see you wiping beads of sweat off your forehead. What was the experience like for you over the past few weeks? First of all, Teresa, that was an excellent 30-second summary. I couldn't have done it better <laughs> myself. Yeah, to your question, it's been exhausting because the days were very long, right? It's like uh, it starts very early in the morning, ends very late, and in between, not a lot is happening. But then the thing is that with these kind of stories, you wait for something to happen, and then suddenly it hits you, and the floodgates open, and everything comes streaming all at once, and then you have to really grasp at the narratives, at the news lines, so you don't get simply drowned in it. And May, I love seeing you on air. You've got your body cam on. You've got a backpack. Sometimes your cheeks are a bit flushed. Covering this is really not for the faint of heart. For you, what was the most memorable part of all of this drama? Well, there are really two parts to it, really historic, happening on the same day of August 22nd. First of all, we've got Taksin coming back. And then second of all, we've got Seta Tawisin being voted in as Thailand's 30th prime minister. So the first part of it was outside the airport, really. That's where you saw me, you know, getting all geared up and, you know, cheeks were flushed from the heat outside. (laughs) For that one, what was poignant was when you have uh, lots of the pro Thaksin supporters that camped out overnight, really, outside the airport. And they had travelled from various provinces across the country, particularly from the north as well as northeastern part of Thailand, to just be there. And more importantly is they didn't even get the chance to see Thaksin. The car didn't even come around and they were all right with it. They were like, it's fine. As long as I'm here, as long as I'm within distance in the land that he's standing on, that's good enough for them. (laughs) The second point was over at Puer Thai because after when Tuxin had arrived back into Thailand, then I headed over to Puer Thai where I expected the supporters to come in. They were waiting already at Puer Thai headquarters and that was another interesting moment because when Parliament actually ended up voting for Seta Tawisin to be the next prime minister. There were not just cries of joy, but there were also tears being shed. And also, a lot of the older folks were thumping their chest and giving the thumbs up sign and almost saying, thank goodness that we have a prime minister finally. So all of these two moments really was something that was very memorable to me, actually. When you cover a story like this, Saksith, what are the biggest challenges? We know there are hordes of other media. You've got the clock ticking to your next report. And above all, you have to make sure you got the facts right. Well, as most of your viewers and listeners know, the Thai politics can be very confusing at the best of times when you have so many layers, <laughs> so many different personalities and so much history as well attached to that. It's not easy to follow that. And then imagine a casual viewer getting lost. And that is something that we as experts, as reporters on the ground, really have to grasp and also to condense them down to a very digestible form for viewers and especially for an international crowd as well that doesn't follow Thailand on a daily basis. But 
this time around, the past three months, they were even more special, even more crazy because the rumor wheel was spinning at hyperspeed. And sometimes you also hear the most ludicrous rumors at times as well. But then, you know, with the Thai colleagues, for example, we are all in the same boat. We all share the same space. It helps also for me that I can speak Thai. We wait for hours and hours for nothing to happen or for something to happen. And we always pass the time with each other chatting and also maybe talking about other stuff than work for example so this is how you can (laughs) get through a 14-hour workday (laughs) <laughs> May is smiling. She understands. <laughs> okay, May, let's talk about Seta Tawisin. There are lots of images of him out there. And what really strikes me is that in nearly every one of those photos, he towers above those around him. Per Tongtan Shinawat, Taksin's youngest daughter, she only reaches his shoulders. And that gives me the impression that Mr. Seta is a very imposing figure. And reports say he is 1.92 meters. What is it like being in the same room as him. Well, if you think that Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong is tall in Singapore, then you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> Simply because Seta Tawisin really does tower over everyone else. Great for cameras because then he will never be lost in the crowd. You can actually spot him from quite far away. But bad for us journalists if we have to stretch out our hands and actually hold the microphone up because it's really a test of your biceps, to be honest with you. But really beyond that is the fact that he has been voted in as the next prime minister. Unfortunately, he hasn't really been speaking to the media in a formal setting. He hasn't really held a news conference to perhaps address all the questions that many journalists have for him. And obviously, there is no doubt that inevitably he would be compared to, say, the former prime minister or outgoing prime minister of Prayut chan So a lot of people have already drew similarities between the two in the way that they're behaving, in the way that they're talking, and also in the way that they're treating the media. And yet, on the other side of it, he's also being compared to Pisa Lim Jiren Rat. The Move Forward Party Prime Minister nominee who was blocked from being the Prime Minister. So a lot of people are already having a contrast in terms of seeing how Peter was behaving, in terms of how genuine, how earnest he was, and also how reachable and amicable he is with the media. But on the flip side here, we have Seta Tawisin, who is not really that friendly to the media, to be honest with you. And appears to be rather distant. So going forward, we will have to see how this is going to play out. At least he speaks English. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> May, you tried lobbying some questions at Mr. Seta at Putai headquarters the day he won the backing of parliament. You tried asking him, what kind of prime minister is he going to be? He didn't really give you an answer. How would you answer that question? You're right. He didn't really give me an answer. I thought it was a shame. I thought it was a disappointment. I thought he could have used the opportunity to actually reach out, particularly to Thai citizens who actually are listening, are watching us. And so he missed out on that opportunity to address, you know, what many people have been wondering about. He seems to be uh, shrouded in secrecy. Not many people know Seta Tawisin as a person and more so nobody knows him of what kind of a prime minister can he possibly be. So at that moment in time when he turned around and he just snapped, really, to say, I want to be the people's prime minister. I tried asking him, how do you intend to do that? He didn't want to respond to that. I think you have to wait for the formation to be completed first and let us collectively, as a group, try to move this country forward. And then you can judge whether it's fragile or whatnot. And obviously, a lot of people are also quite upset that you have become the Prime Minister. They have accused you of taking over. I am also uh, believe that many people are so happy that we have finally elected the 30th Prime Minister of Thailand. It was, I think, a missed opportunity where he could have actually gone on to talk about how he potentially would want to mend the social fabric that's really fractured in this society at this point. Sucks that uh, I see you chomping at the bit there. Do you have any comments on that? I mean, it's not only Seta Tawisin himself as the next prime minister and the Pertai party as a ruling party, but also the coalition parties that are in this lot as well. He cobbled together a coalition out of 11 parties, many of them from the outgoing government that have ruled over Thailand for the past four years, including the party of now outgoing prime minister, Prayutan Oshar. So we have seen strange bedfellows in Thai politics, but this has to be up there with 
among the strangest bedfellows <laughs> up there because we have to keep in mind that the Pertai were in the opposition camp and during the election campaign they have called them adversaries, enemies, opponents but now all of a sudden they say you know what forget what we said in the past we are now working together to bring this country forward and we're now we're all supposed to pretend like nothing happened oh, yeah exactly saxiv let's talk about pita lim jara and rat uh, so many hopes were pinned on him and the move forward party its previous incarnation the future forward party was dissolved in 2020 and its leader was banned from politics is that going to be their fate too what is next for move forward or do you think legal troubles are going to take them down the danger of legal troubles and party dissolutions are real. There are already several cases against the um, Move Forward Party and its leader, Peter Lim Rat at the Constitutional Court. Of course, their supporters are going to say they're all politically motivated. They are trying to stop uh, the reformist progressive uh, platform of the party in their tracks, like they did blocking Peter from becoming prime minister, blocking Move Forward from taking over the ruling coalition. And also listeners can go back to the last uh, Thai election episode to listen more about this, but we have seen the party grow. The supporter base has grown hugely over the past few years. When it was Future Forward, it started out pretty well. Then it got dissolved, and now it's the Move Forward party. It got even more voters. And at this trajectory, one can probably confidently say that even if Move Forward is going to be banned or dissolved, then people are still going to vote for them because the election result has clearly shown that people definitely want something else and not more of the same. The future, what we are seeing of the Move Forward Party, at least now in Parliament, they are the biggest bloc in the opposition and they are going to focus on what they did best, and that is in the legislature. In the past four years, they have an opposition party that has been very much putting the finger in the wound, that have been always been nitpicking about the government coalition, trying to point out faults, trying to point out mistakes, while at the same time also introducing bills on themselves, for example, marriage equality, liberalization of the alcohol market, these are the things that they are still pursuing, that they're going to pursue themselves. And this is going to be the future of the Move Forward Party, at least in the immediate future. May, there are now 11 coalition party members with so many different ideologies. Sometimes I can't decide what's for dinner with one husband, let alone 11 people. What challenges lie ahead for the SETA government? You're right. Having two parties or three parties within a coalition is already difficult enough. To have 11 altogether is just a mess. That's already an understatement. A couple of challenges right up top. Number one is the fact that, as Saksit had said earlier, it's about the fact that these are parties that Poor Thai were locking horns with previously. They were considered enemies for one, is the fact that Prayut Chanocha's United Thai Nation Party, that he's no longer a part of right now, as well as the Deputy Prime Minister Prawit Wong Suwan's Palang Pracharat Party, these were members of the parties were responsible for staging the coup to oust the last Shinawat administration back in 2014. So that's one. Already you have someone who took your government down previously, now you are sleeping and working with them. The second point is in the last parliament, poor Thai members of parliament, they were the ones who were also behind central motions trying to oust the administration of Prayut Chanocha. They were the ones who actually targeted a number of these spaces whom you see right now within the coalition party. Can you imagine that they were actually fighting to kick them out in the last administration, but now they have pretty much joined hands with them to work together? The final point is the fact that at the moment, before the government is even put together, before the cabinet ministers have even been identified, already the other parties are criticizing some of Poor Thai Party's key policies. For one, is the 10,000 baht digital wallet, which they want to roll out for every Thai citizen above the age of 16 to allow them, so to speak, some free money for a certain period of time. But already that policy had been called into question by many of the other coalition parties asking them, how exactly are you going to fund this? And they are demanding that Poor Thai come out to explain that. And yet another issue that they're taking issue with is the changing or the tweaking of the constitution. Already other parties have identified certain areas that they have said Poor Thai cannot 
touch at all. So already these are perhaps obstacles and barriers which you're already seeing before the cabinet is being formed. So imagine going forward, a lot more disagreements can be expected, a lot more arguments can be expected, but more importantly as well, who is going to head some of the very key ministries? That will be something to watch for because there are certain portfolios that every party is trying to wrangle for. On the point of the cabinet seats, the old school tie way is that they are always agreeing on what they want to do, which cabinet post goes to which party first, because especially the smaller parties, they are vying for cabinet portfolios that are lucrative, to say the least. Ministries that have um, big budgets, for example, I'm going to say it plainly straighter. These parties together, they are probably going to cancel each other out for the next four years because <laughs> they are so on different points. Another example that I can highlight here, the Boom Jai Tai Party is the second biggest party in this law. And they have been very famous for decriminalizing cannabis in the past few years. And the Pur Thai Party, they campaigned to, against all kinds of drugs. They want to put cannabis back on the narcotics list. And now they are both in the same government. So it's going to be very interesting to see how they're going to square that up. Success is that they're going to cancel themselves out within the next four years. But a lot of people are also saying and not sure if they can last four years. They might even end up not being able to complete their term. Good point. As you say, May, mess is not even enough to describe what's happening. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephen Chia, and I'm host of CNA's weekly news podcast, Heart of the Matter. Each week, my job is to ask the questions you have, like why is the COE so high? Why aren't singles dating? Or what's going on with the red-hot property market in Singapore? If you want the views behind the news, then tune in each week as we get to the heart of the matter. We are on the CNA and Me Listen apps and wherever you get your podcasts. Hit follow or subscribe so you don't miss an episode when it drops. What you just heard were throngs of supporters cheering as they caught their first glimpse of former Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawat moments after he landed in Bangkok. He's smiling from ear to ear. His palms are pressed together in front of his face, greeting the crowd. Saksit, we could do another episode just on his return. Can you talk to us about what that moment was like and, of course, the timing of it? I think we can do a whole series on taxing himself. <laughs> okay, <yeah. laughs> um, as you said before, he's been gone uh, in self-exile for the past 15 years. And there have always been constant rumors and hints about his return. But over the years, it has become one of these... I believe it until you see it kind of things. You wouldn't actually believe that he's actually here until he touches Thai's soil. You said about coincidence. I mean, this is an audio podcast, so you can't see the quotation marks that I'm making here. But there have been many observers that say that what's happening right now in Thai politics is linked and intertwined with Thaksin's fate, and especially what's happening right now going forward with him. After he has arrived in Thailand, um, his family has greeted, but so did the police. They have welcomed him with an arrest warrant because he has been sentenced in absentia to several years in prison for cases ranging from abuse of power, corruption, and negligence. Right now, as we record this, he's supposed to be in a hospital under close watch because of underlying health conditions. But there are, of course, rumors saying that he's not going to step one foot in a prison cell and he's going to be out of detention very soon. Now, legally speaking, he can seek a royal pardon. And there is no problem with that. The question is that how quickly will that be granted from him? And thus, how quickly will he get out of prison? The second question related to Taxon is that he says, yes, I'm going to step away from politics. I want to raise my granddaughter, seven grandkids. But for a man like him who has influenced Thai politics for the past 20 years, for better or worse, is somebody like him ever really out of politics? May, what do Thais think of the return of this fugitive former prime minister? Thaksin was hugely popular, especially among the rural poor. And now that he's back after 15 years, is that popularity going to continue? Exactly. Is he really ever out of politics? I think the answer is no. A couple of reasons. I'll come back to your question first in terms of the rural population. And that's exactly what I observed. Outside of the airport where he was actually landed, there were tons of people outside. And where were they from? Well, 
largely the rural provinces. And that is also indicative of his sway and his popularity till today. One thing that I asked them earlier when he was arriving, I said, why are you here? Why do you think Thaksin will be able to help change Thailand? And they credited him for a couple of things. One, they will always remember the 30 baht healthcare policy that he rolled out. That healthcare policy really stuck because it gave them affordable medical care. It gave them access to medical care and at a very, very cheap price. And yet another point was they said he's very smart. He will be able to come up with policies to help boost the Thai economy because during that time that he was running the administration back in the early 2000 to 2006, well, the point is he brought right? Economic growth to this country. But remember here that economic conditions have also changed over the years. And this was an administration which he ruled 20 years ago. And yet these people continue to believe him and continue to actually reflect on what he did back then. So my point is about the fact that they are latching on to that memory. They're hoping that he can again create waves and changes to bring about positive change because ultimately the people are suffering. They have been suffering because of the economic conditions. And whether or not he's ever left politics, well, over the last 20 years, he may not be in the country, but he has always had a finger in the pie. Look at the fact that Poor Thai Party actually is almost representative of him through his daughter, Petong Tan Shinawat. Otherwise, why would she be in the party? Otherwise, why would she be even nominated as one of the prime minister candidates that the party was putting up for? So clearly it shows that the thread has still not been cut. He is still very much a very force to be reckoned with within the party and he wields a lot of power in making decisions and in also advising executive party members on which direction they should go, particularly with this particular government which they're leading highly unlikely that this is by coincidence that he came back on the same day that the country was supposed to choose the prime minister candidate from Poor Thai Party. The question really remains on how long will this new government led by Poor Thai be able to last? Yeah, first of all, it's not only the policies that uh, Thaksin introduced that has gained him a following in the rural areas, but because through that, he has given the rural folks a political consciousness and they have been given a consciousness that direct participation in politics yields direct tangible results because at that time it felt like a drip feed from Bangkok going to the provinces. Back then when Thaksin came to the scene in the early 2000s, he presented himself as a champion of a suffering middle class because the Asian financial crisis was not too long ago at that time. In the same way, Seta is actually presenting himself as a champion of the current middle class and also of a current economy that has also suffered very much during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the emphasis of this incoming Pertai government is going to be economy, economy and economy. I think it's going to be very tough about the fact that Seta is positioning himself as a middle class champion like Thaksin, simply for the fact that Seta Tawisin was a former chief of Sensiri one of the largest property developer here in Thailand. Whenever he walks around and wherever he walks around, he seems to be very, very uncomfortable and awkward, particularly reaching out to the lower class, particularly reaching out to the disadvantaged. So already you can start to see in terms of the personality, the character, and I'm not sure that whatever he says in terms of the policies that are being rolled out is coming from him per se, as opposed to coming from the party, because a lot of people are not really holding out faith on him. They're holding out faith on poor Thai party. But although he has said to me, give them a chance, give him a chance to run this country. Former property tycoon becoming leader. Does this remind you of anybody? All right. Before we go, Saks, I want you to take off your journalist hat for a second. As a Thai yourself, how do all these developments make you feel about what's happening in your country? It wasn't only the last three months, it's also the two months of covering the election campaign before that. So it's been quite a marathon at sprint speed for the past five months for not only me, but also for me and the rest of the team here in Bangkok. And one thing that really strikes out to me is the emotional whiplash that you uh, experienced during these couple months compared to the immediate aftermath of the election where the move forward has won the most seats and we had so many people being cheerful, joyful, optimistic about Thailand's future. 
I've been covering Thai politics for the past 15 years, and I've never seen such a stark contrast between what the majority of the Thai electorate actually wanted and what they actually got. They voted for an end of old school transactional money politics. And they also include the Pur Thai party in that as well. They wanted something more idealistic, something more with a policy approach. But instead, we got exactly more of the same and the Pur Thai party has shown its true colors. What's so striking about this and also infuriating, honestly, for many Thais is that how blatant everything was, how blatant to see that this is just a means to an end, blocking the move forward party for to what end, having taxing back in the country to what end. And they're also saying what we said earlier, that this government touts itself as a government that is ending divisions and political polarizations. But in fact, they only just redrew the political lines and it's everybody against the move forward party. Having said that, there has been a growing base and a growing electorate of Thais that want to see actual tangible change in Thailand. This is only going to go in the same direction. Yes, three, four years is a very long time. A lot of things can happen, even though this new government will not have a honeymoon period, if they can actually pull everything off, which both of us are very skeptical. Yes, they might have a chance. But nevertheless, it doesn't change the fact that Thais have a new political consciousness. They want to see an end of military intervention in politics. They want to amend the royal prerogative in Thai politics. All I can say after almost half a year covering this election cycle and as we are seeing a new government, change is coming. Change is in progress. It just doesn't have a timetable. Fascinating developments and really fascinating to hear your side of the story, Saksit and May. Thanks so much for your insights, guys. Thanks for having us. You're welcome. The TV version of CNA Correspondent airs on CNA every Wednesday at 9.30 p.m. Catch up with them anytime on cna.asia. The team behind this episode is Jacqueline Chan, Clara Ong, Crispina Robert, and me, Teresa Tang. Until next time. Experience the life-changing benefits of automated insulin delivery with the T-Slim X2 Insulin Pump from Tandem Diabetes Care. Snack while you meal prep, doze off on the couch, wear it fashionably or discreetly. You can do it all with the number one rated automated insulin delivery system according to a DQ&A patient panel. Get started at TandemDiabetes.com. Rx only, indicated for patients with type 1 diabetes 6 years and older. Warning, Control IQ technology should not be used by people under age 6 or who use less than 10 units of insulin per day or who weigh less than 55 pounds. Safety info available at TandemDiabetes.com slash safety info.